can you guys hear me? Voice uh, voice coming over okay? Um, you can either unmute or you can uh, put it in the chat. I can hear you, Larry. Okay, good. All right. Well, we're going to start here about a minute. So um, just wait. We've got a few more people coming on, I see. So we're kind of working in the dark. So my background looks a little dark. It's a rainy, cloudy day here in Green Bay. So if I turn on the light, it shines off my forehead. So we'll leave the light off. So. All right, by my watch, it's seven o'clock, so we'll get things started. Uh, my name is Larry Lemons. I'm with Gustav Larson. We're going to talk about uh, variable speed outdoor heat pumps and air conditioners today, go over the uh, install and setup. Um, this class originally was probably about four or five hours when we first rolled it out, so I, I condensed it into a two hour time period. So if you got any questions, stop me or ask questions. Um, or give me a call after the meeting and, and we can go over uh, things to talk about. So uh, with that, we'll get started. Um, again, it's Variable Speed Outdoor. Um, there's my phone number if anybody needs to get a hold of me. I think you all have my, my uh, email address. But one thing I want to point out is there's a website. It's fieldtechhelp.com, and it's got a bunch of uh, really good videos on. We'll probably use a couple toward the end of the meeting here. but uh, there's seven or eight videos regarding this equipment. If you watched every one of these videos, it's going to cover it's it's going to cover everything that I'm doing this morning. So, uh, if you miss anything or if you're looking for more detail, you know, go online and get on these videos, and, and uh, we'll go from there. So, we're going to talk about safety, um, installation basics. We're going to get in a little bit on communication. Um, we're going to talk about the uh, the setup, the, the variable speed control. Uh, commissioning, sequence of operation, um, and there's a little bit of a warranty difference on this one because it's a it, it's a high-end piece of equipment. Um, most parts on this are a mandatory return, so you know when you if you if you do do a warranty, make sure you hang on to the parts. Don't get rid of the parts for at least 90 days after the, the warranty. Um, this isn't the first time we've you know, uh, dealt with variable speed equipment. We had the XV 1500 back in 1987 already. Um, it was a true variable speed, but the electronics have gotten a lot better and we've learned a lot from this. Um, and, and when we first rolled these out, uh, we didn't have liquid injection to, um, or not liquid injection, but liquid cooled condenser um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit too. But again, we've had the variable speed equipment in the field till 87 from, or from 87 to 96. Uh, we went to a two compressor unit at that time and we've been back in variable speed equipment since about 2013. So um, we've been at it quite a while. Right now there's two different uh, versions of this model. There's a, the, the, the uh, XLI product, um, the 18 and the 20 sear. And we've got a side discharge unit that's a 19 sear. <clears throat> that one comes in heat pump only. Uh, and they all come in equal sizes, two, three, four, five ton, okay? Um, one of the things that initially out of the box we couldn't do with these units was we couldn't low ambient cool below 55 degrees outdoor temperature. Uh, there's a software package that's been changed on these units. Um, we, can, we can cool down to about 45 degrees outdoor ambient now with these and we can heat down to probably 20 below zero with the heat pump. So a uh, pretty wide range of operation. I've tested both models in my house and um, they're, they're really rock solid units. Um, I've taken a preference to the side discharge unit just because it's quieter. It only runs at about 45 decibels. Um, and uh, it's, uh, you know, just, just a little quieter unit. So uh, remember when you're putting these units in, uh, approved combinations and accessories only. So when, you, when you're dealing with the variable speed outdoor, 
it has to be matched with a variable speed indoor or it has to be matched with a uh, S9 V2 with a relay panel, but it absolutely has to have a 950. Excuse me, if it's an older one, it would be a 950. The newer ones are 850s and the 1050s. Um, so it'll run with the TAM Air, the TAM 8, the TAM 8, the TAM 9, um, or the S9 V2, but in this case, it has to have a relay panel, okay? Um, we can also use these on zoning systems. They're fully compatible with zoning. Um, but they will not work on a competitor's product. So you, you have to use it on a train or American standard piece of equipment. Um, it has to be either communicating or have the ability in the S9 V2 or TEM8 for the BK to be enabled. <clears throat> um, and you'll see why, because we control this a little differently and, and you'll see as we go down the road. But again, make sure it's a matched piece of equipment. Make sure there's an HRI number on it. Uh, if you're going to use a, uh, um, a coil, uh, it's, it's got to be a trainer, American Standard coil. We can't get a rating with the ADP. Um, we just don't have the capability with the ADP coils to get the ratings and have the proper refrigerant uh, charge in them. So again, AHRI match, make sure that, that, that it, that's what we're, uh, we're dealing with. There's some safety on here. If you look at it, the drive has some safety warnings. The PFC choke gets warm. That's this um, section right here that'll leave a little waffle mark on your arm if you touch it. Um, we do run up to 400 volts DC on these units um, with, with the drive, with the, uh, the converter in here. So make sure that you're aware of the 400 volts. Um, if you turn the power off, wait two minutes. Um, or you can go down to these two little pins here and discharge it through your voltmeter too. So again, it's a little different animal. Make sure you're, you're aware of the safety ratings. Um, PFC choke gets warm. On the, on the side discharge unit, it's a little different. The, the drive is separated from the control. Uh, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But on the side discharge, it's got the same basic drive in here. Uh, but it's, it's separated from the main control. On the, uh, the 18 and 20 SEER units, the controls all in one, separated into to two different components. Um, the high voltage on these boards on the, the 18 and 20 SEER comes in on the top of the unit, which would be these two pins right here. Here's your fan motor, your high voltage fan motor for the condenser fan. And then here is your um, leads to the compressor. And on these units, they're labeled, it'll show up in a different uh, slide here, but they're labeled UWV, which indicates that it's a variable speed um, digitally driven compressor. So anytime you see UWV, it's a three phase compressor, but it's a modulating, it's a uh, variable speed compressor. Um, on the variable speed side discharge units again, um, it's a little different, but our voltage comes in on the top of the board here. The voltage to the compressor comes out the bottom, and here you can see the UVW designation. Um, that's for variable flow, variable frequency compressors. Uh, again, it's, it's kind of the same layout, but the board is separated from the, uh, the, the drive on the side discharge units. Okay, now let's see here. There we go. Um, and again, these are the differences between the two. So on the 18 and 20 here, what you see is we have the, the CDA, the, the display here. That's all your setup, your, uh, your information, your options. Uh, that's all done through the CDA. And then the drive is actually uh, liquid cooled. And what we mean by that is we take the liquid line, we run it through a heat sink on the, on the uh, drive um, aluminum here and then we run it out to the unit. And this absorbs heat from the, the board. It pulls it out through the heat sink. Um, in the summertime, we've tested these in the desert. They run up to 50 degrees cooler just by doing this, okay? And it only adds one or two degrees to our subcool. Um, so that's how we, uh, we, we uh, accomplish that. This is the board that's behind that heat sink. So this is a, it's an all-in-one board. There's the AOC and the MOC board is all in one, your inverter drive is right here. These are your inverter drive section down here. Um, and that's what's behind that heat sink on, the, uh, on these units. On the side discharge units, if you look at them, the board is actually mounted on the side here. 
and the drive is mounted behind it on the back wall of the uh, the cabinet. So uh, this is this is two separate components on the side discharge unit. Um, on the side discharge, we have the AOC, the um, application oriented and the motor oriented. So this operates uh, the applications and controls, and this takes care of the motor drive for the compressor. On the um, side discharge unit, we have a display that's attached to the board. So this display on the, on the uh, 18 and 20 series is a separate component, but on the side discharge, it's actually part of the board. It sits right on the board here, down here. And then your, uh, your programming, your up and down, left, right, uh, enter buttons are all just on the board right below it. So it's a little different but it basically functions the same way. It's, it's got the same operation as the other one does. Um, on the, uh, again, on the, the 18 and 20 sear, this is one single board. On the variable speed units, we actually use what they call an optocoupler. So this is actually an optical um, coupler that, that uh, sends information from the AOC to the MOC board. Um, and if you look at the, uh, the configuration on this, what it is, it's a, it's, it's a five wire connector, five, six wire connector. Um, there's a power supply, there's a, there's, a, there's a power supply for the board. Um, and then the data, data A and B are, term, are pins three and four. Um, that's a receive data and that's transmit data. Um, this is your AOC reset signal. And of course, number six is gonna be your ground. So again, on an 18 sear side discharge, we do it just a little bit different. It's, it's two separate boards instead of one. On the, on the boards, we also have these input terminals. And if you look at them, they all have different uh, information. A lot of this, these, these sensors are gonna be five volt DC sensors. So on terminal one and 10, that's your dome temperature sensor, which we'll get into. Uh, your coil temperature sensor, your suction temperature sensors, uh, your ambient temperature sensors, your suction or suction pressure transducers, all of that information is on this 18 pin connector here. Um, we have uh, the, of course, the power coming in, the, the power to, to the condenser fan. Uh, we've got the LSOV. This is a little different and we'll, we'll talk about that. We've got a switchover valve in here that's a latching switchover valve. It actually operates on three volts DC. And it, when, you, when you put it in the cooling mode, there's a magnetic <clears throat> um, little, little uh, component in there that holds it in the cooling mode. When you give it a three volt DC signal, it puts it into the heating mode. And it, there's a magnetic component on the other end of the switchover valve where it will hold it in that position. So it latches back and forth. It doesn't automatically drop back into cooling or heating. Um, whatever, um, you know, whatever stage you left it in, that's where it stays. But it's a latching valve. And again, that's a three volt DC signal. Uh, we've got a component on here for external outdoor temperature. Um, that's in case the indoor or in case the outdoor ambient sensor is, is um, biased by the sun or temperature or something, you can always add an external temperature sensor and move that sensor up under the eave or under the, the, uh, the siding or you know, somewhere else. So that, that's what that's on there for. Um, here's your EEV, that's a six wire. That's for your electronic expansion valve. And then here's your display for your CDA. Um, if you wanted to access these with a computer, there's a data port. Um, there's a special wire for that. And then your DRB is your communication wire. So that's data red and blue, which would be data, 24 volt hot and 24 volt common. Okay. All of these pins are different configurations. As you can see, they're different shapes. Um, you shouldn't be able to cross these and get the wrong pin on the wrong connector. That's not a challenge, but um, it, it's designed so that when you put the board back in, it just goes in one particular position. So um, on the side discharge board, kind of the same thing. The board's laid out a little differently. Um, we've got our 18 pin connector out here, but we've got the same thing. We got our external 
um, connections for temperature here. Um, we've got the, the uh, latching switchover valve is here. A um, couple of things that are different is we have the onboard CDA and the, the setup and, and um, access pins or access points here. Um, we have a force defrost button that on the board we can actually force it into defrost. Um, and we have some common status lights on the board. Um, so a little bit different, a little bit um, laid out a little bit differently, but it's pretty much the same kind of operation that we're, we're seeing on the other units. So. Okay, on the side discharge, we also have, you know, your high pressure connections are here. Um, we have drive diagnostics here also, okay. Um, you, can, you can access drive diagnostics by getting in, or, you know, by pushing this button, and I think it's on the next page. Um, yeah, if you get into drive diagnostics, um, it'll tell you what the LED is doing if you have a normal condition, um, a constant on. It gives you the different uh, information here. So you can run a drive diagnostic on this one by using this button right here. On the other model, you have to go into the CDA and put it into a drive test. But you basically can do all of the diagnostics on this unit without taking your meter out of the bag. Um, everything's done through the CDA or the di drive diagnostics. Um, it either passes or fails. And uh, if it does fail at, at that point, then we start taking some ohm readings, some volt readings. Um, you know, that's the point where we need to get our meters out. Um, again, you can get it from one of either two locations. You can do it through the CDA or do the test button on there. And again, here's the the um, the outcome of that. Now, on the board, you're going to have um, some different LEDs. Of course, the red is going to be for your fault LED. Um, green is like a it's like the heartbeat. It's like the uh, um, uh, that's that's monitored from the uh, I forget what they call it, but uh, I'll, I'll get that in a second. But the yellow LED is your Com LED. Uh, that's probably the more important one when you're looking at the system. Uh, the yellow LED, it tells you how many pieces of communicating equipment are on the bus. So the data line is our bus line. And if this is flashing four times, that means I have four pieces of communicating equipment. That would be the outdoor unit, uh, the indoor unit, the, the communicating thermostat, and in this case, maybe a clean effects or AccuClean air cleaner. Um, if it was flashing three times, it would probably be the indoor, the outdoor, and the thermostat. Uh, if you get to a system and the yellow light is on solid, that means that piece of equipment is not communicating. So um, if you've got three pieces of equipment on there and you go to the furnace and you only see two flashes, uh, you go to the outdoor and the, the light's on solid, that means the outdoor unit's not communicating. It's, it's, uh, there's something wrong with the communication and we need to dig deeper at that point. Now, I don't know if any of you guys have seen any of our competitors' um, equipment out there, but this is, this is the train, American Standard, um, the carrier green speed, a um, lot of wires in there, Nordine. Again, um, we've really worked very, very hard to keep this as simple and user-friendly as possible. So, um, you know, we hope you guys like what you see, but it's, it's been, uh, they put a lot of work and effort into to keeping this as, user-friendly to the service tech as possible. All right, so we've got on the unit, we've got the CDA, the communicating display. And if you look at it, it's got the same four arrows, got the enter button um, as the side discharge does, just a little different configuration. Um, we've got the drive, which is, is in the unit right here. Um, we've got an ambient temperature sensor. Now, on the 18 and 20 here, this ambient temperature sensor just hangs out of the bottom of the panel here. And on the side discharge unit, it actually comes out the back of the panel and is on the, it, it's mounted to the back of the condenser coil on the outside of the unit. Um, we've got an EEV and a stepper motor in here. Uh, I know you guys are starting to see more and more of this in the field, but basically that stepper motor can be popped off. It's just held on by a clip. Uh, you can ohm it out. You can check it out. Um, and, and, uh, it's real simple to work with. Uh, and again, good refrigeration practices. You shouldn't have any EV issues. 
We've got a latching switchover valve. Again, this looks just like a, a reversing valve or a switchover valve in any other unit. Uh, difference is this unit has a three volt signal to this valve and that's that will uh, pull it open or pull it to heating or pull it to cooling. Now, if you, you know, just kind of a quick review on switchover valves. These tubes right here are actually what move the valve. So what we do is we take high pressure gas to the center of this port. And then all we do is we switch the port in this little solenoid valve right here. And if we switch it in one direction, that high pressure gas pushes the plunger this way. And if we switch the uh, port in a different direction, that high pressure gas pushes it back this way. So that's all we're doing. We're using the pressure in the system to move the valve back and forth. We're just using the electric to uh, switch this pilot valve here. Um, and again, depending on what you've got going on with the system, um, this is your suction line. So if we come in here and we go through the suction line to the compressor, we should be picking up maybe a couple degrees here because when this is the suction line, actually these two become, or if this is the suction line, these two become the discharge line. Um, so you shouldn't pick up more than two, three degrees. Um, if you pick up 13 degrees or more, this valve is definitely leaking through and it needs to be replaced. So um, make sure that when you check these, you check the in and the out for each one of these to make sure they're within a couple degrees of each other. Um, coil temperature sensor is down here. Uh, we use that for defrost. Suction temperature sensor, um, again, that's just to monitor suction temperature and superheat. And then, our, again, our ambient sensor is outside. Uh, one of the things that you want to remember is this is a muffler. Uh, we use these on actually quite a few pieces of equipment. Now, um, I've had guys change these out with dryers. That's not a, not a good thing. What happens is all the desiccant gets uh, thrown into the system, plugs the system up. So if, if you ever run into one of these, this is a muffler. It's just, just there to absorb any noise from the compressor, okay? Um, we've got a high pressure cutout. High pressure cutouts on these units are, are brazed in, okay? If you ever see a high pressure cutout that's on a Schrader valve, it probably doesn't have a Schrader underneath it. Um, the code doesn't allow for valves to be underneath um, uh, safety devices. Suction pressure transducer. <clears throat> And again, we use that to calculate superheat. Um, we'll get into the operation, but these units actually look at the superheat and they speed up and slow down uh, the compressor based on that. So um, it does a calculation in the board and, and the superheat is taken into account when, when these units are running. Um, and again, these are permanent magnets in here and we've got an ECM outdoor fan motor. All right, some of the basics, I'm gonna see if I have any questions here quick, but um, nope, we're good. So some of the basics on these units are, even though they're variable speed, even though they're inverter driven equipment, um, they install pretty much like anything else. So if you, you know, you gotta have good, good, uh, good place to set them. You gotta have, um, you know, clean line set. The, the basic refrigeration things apply. Maximum is 150 feet, maximum lift is 50 feet. Because these are variable speed, um, we do have some limitations on that. We can't go to 250 feet or 200 feet. Um, max 150, max lift 50 feet. So we can be above or we can be below 50 feet, um, which is pretty versatile if you think of it. Um, but there are some restrictions when you get into the, the line sets. Um, if you look at these heat pump models, here are two ton. Um, I can use five eighths, three eighths. And if you look at note A, it says 150 feet, maximum 50 foot lift. Um, when I get into the bigger models, if I get into a, a, a five ton heat pump, it says that I can use inch and an eighth, three eighths, but then my, uh, my um, restriction is B, uh, must not exceed 80 feet, okay? So when you get into these bigger models, you know, make sure you look at the notes. Here's another one, the, AC, the air conditioning um, it, on the five ton is 
inch and an eighth, and my note C says I can't exceed 80 feet, can't lift more than 25 feet. Now, there is an alternate line set on these, okay? So if I, um, if I look at my two ton, I can go to three quarter and it will work fine. I can go five sixteenths on my liquid line um, and that's fine. And it gives me note A, which means 150 feet or 50, and 50 foot of lift, which is great. Um, my three ton, I can actually use seven eighths, but when I use seven eighths, I can only go to 80 feet. Um, if I go to that five ton heat pump now and I use seven eighths or three quarter inch, and that's perfectly allowable, um, I can go to note A or 150 feet again. Same on the heat pump, seven eighths, three eighths. I can go to 150 feet on those. And th this one, if you're not sure, give me a call on them, but these alternate line sizings work well. But remember, when you downsize the suction line, there's a little bit of uh, capacity loss. May not be much, might be one or 2,000 BTUs. Um, we can run it on the program and, and take a look at that. Uh, but there are options on these units to get to these longer line lengths. Uh, because it's a variable speed compressor, um, there are some things built in that, that allow us to do that. And um, there's more of that coming. So if you got any questions on this, now's the time to speak up or throw me a note. We'll take a quick look here. And uh, I guess we're good. So we'll continue on. <clears throat> All right, also charging by weight. Um, and, and this is kind of a new, new thing across the board. What you're finding is a lot of the equipment is coming through with no additional charge for line set. So we used to have 15 feet. Um, on the variable speed, the charge that comes in the unit is enough for the unit itself. You have to add to the line set and the coil, okay? So uh, if you're using an 18 sear, uh, say a three ton unit, the factory charge is eight pounds, three ounces. I have to add eight, eight ounces for the coil and six tenths of an ounce per foot. If you, and if you look at this on a three inch line set, uh, it's six tenths of, of an ounce per foot on all of them. So if I have a system on a, a three ton and I, I add my eight ounces and I have 25 feet of line set, that's gonna be six, 12, and yeah, probably about 15 ounces uh, for the line set and eight ounces for that, so you're looking at 23 ounces. So um, about a pound and a half of refrigerant in there. So on, the, on these units, just make sure that um, you measure your line set. You can weigh this in, and you know if it's a winter job or a cooler job where you can't start it right away, you're gonna be pretty close. I mean, it should get you very close to right, right to where you need to be. So uh, make sure that you don't forget to add to the line set on these variable speed pieces of equipment. Um, they send, they send a uh, worksheet in there so you can work it out if you need to. Um, I would recommend, I recommend this on all jobs anyways, inside the cover when you get the final charge in there, just write down the total charge or on the outside of the cover. Um, make it easy for the next guy when he comes along to know how much is supposed to go back in there. Uh, but we do put that worksheet in the, in the book for you also. You can also charge by subcool if you need to. So if you, um, you know, if it's cooler outside and it's say it's 35 degrees and we know our indoor temp is 70, um, we should be running about three and a, whoops, three and a quarter in the back up here. And again, if it's 20, 35 outside, um, our suction pressure is going to be in the in the mid 70s, somewhere in that area. So you can charge in cooler weather and get get fairly close. Um, or you can always charge by subcool. So if you throw it in a test mode, and we're going to show you how to do that in a little while. But if you throw it in test mode and charge it to usually eight to ten degrees of subcool, that that's fine too. So it's it's not that difficult to charge. The key is you have to make sure if you're if you're doing subcool, is to make sure it's in test mode that's running at high speed, and the fan is also at high speed. <clears throat> Um, the refrigerant line set design, again, the, the, the reason we can get away with some of the lines that we do is that we've got some algorithms built into the board. Um, the compressor has an extra high capacity 
uh, oil pump in it. It pumps about 300% more than a typical scroll compressor does. Um, and we also have a program in there, which we'll get into in a little bit, that allows for oil return. Um, again, low loss uh, fittings on your hoses. Um, these units are, I should say now, the, the 18 and 20 sear are, have PVE oil on them, polyvinyl ether or ether, however you pronounce that. Um, the side discharge unit, the eight or the 19 sear, has POE oil in it. So just make sure that you know if you put any oil in there, add any oil. This is PVE, it's a little different. Um, and you can mix up to 10%. So if it's, uh, if it's POE or mineral that, that's in a line set, if you're going to reuse the line set, if you have to reuse the line set, um, and you don't get all the oil out of there, that's not that big a deal. Just make sure everything's clean. You know, make sure we don't have any uh, dirt or burnout or anything like that in the system. Uh, the two and three tons hold 36 ounces, and the compressor on the four and the five ton hold 45 ounces. So it's a, it's a fair amount of oil. Um, and it's oil 00305 from Global Parts for the PVE oil, if you need any. All right, safety. Uh, we've got, if, if you probably noticed, we have more safety stickers on and we have badges for the, the brand these days. Um, you know, just be careful with the stuff. There's high voltage, there's pressurized refrigerant. Um, you know, we, uh, we use the proper personal protective gear. Um, one of the things that's very, very important is that we have a ground on here. Yeah, make sure we have a ground on here. Um, this is a inverter driven piece of equipment. It's very dependent on having a ground. So uh, if you're putting the system in on an older building or, or an older um, application and they're trying, they're using the conduit, that's not an acceptable ground. You've got to have a dedicated ground wire back to the panel um, or you're going to have problems with your inverter. Um, so again, ground is very, very important on inverter driven equipment needs that needs that to reference uh, what's going on with the, the system. Um, oh, this is kind of a repeat, but uh, again, the choke can get very warm. There's a 400, to 400 volt warning on the, on the label. And this shows the two pins. If you want to discharge the inverter, just take your voltmeter, set it to volts, DC volts, and discharge it through your voltmeter. And then this, the system will be safe. And it'll also give you some test points to see what you're your voltages and it could be 300 it could be 360 it could be 400 volts um, it could be anywhere in that range depending on, on what we're working on um, if you're working on a 208 system it's going to be a little less uh, if you're working on a 240 volt system of course it's going to be a little higher so all right minimum requirements for good communication this system operates a little bit different differently so the way that the variable speed equipment works is that the capacity request is done all by the thermostat. So the thermostat, um, it, it creates something called load value or load demand. And when it gets to a certain point, it triggers the system to go into operation. Uh, the higher the load value, the, the higher the speed of the equipment, okay? So what it does is, on a, on a, I'm going to jump back to a typical system, what we do is, you know, we we uh, we turn the thermostat on, we start the furnace, and then the heat pump comes on, or the AC comes on, and everything just kind of works together. But the the furnace controls the the outdoor unit. On the variable speed system, it's just backwards from that. The outdoor unit controls the indoor unit. Okay, so when we give it a data request, it sends a request to the outdoor unit, and it tells the outdoor unit what speed we need to work at and where we need to be. And the outdoor unit sends a signal to the indoor unit and controls the blower. So it, it tells the blower what speed to run at. So as we're monitoring superheat and, and load value at the outdoor unit, the outdoor unit actually speeds up and slows down the blower to try to maintain a certain superheat and a certain load value based on what the thermostat's telling it to do. So it's a little backwards from what we're used to seeing in the field. And that's part of the reason that you know, we can't just put this on anybody's piece of equipment. We have to have an indoor piece of equipment that can talk to our blower motor 
And it, in the case of the modulating equipment, it's, it's done through the communication wire. And in the case of an S9 or a Chem 8 air handler, what we do is we use a relay panel and then we energize the BK wire and the BK basically controls the speed of that blower. So um, that's, that's, the, that's how the system works and that's the reason that we're limited to using it, uh, our piece of equipment. All right, so the, the, the communication setup is pretty simple. We've got three wires, okay? We've got a, a DR and a B, so data. All of our communication is done on this one brown wire, this data wire, okay? Talks to the outdoor, talks to the indoor, talks to whatever we've got connected to the system. Um, red and blue is basically 24 volts hot and uh, 24 volts common. So that's there just to power the display, power the system, uh, power the boards, okay? Um, and that's that's your typical wiring. Whether it's a, um, you know, whether it's a, a, a eighteen twenty sear or it's a side discharge nineteen sear. So the the wiring schematic goes like this: DRB data red and blue. Um, to the outdoor unit, we only need two wires. Really, we only need data, and we need common to operate the outdoor unit. We would use red only if there's load shed. So if you're gonna Connect the unit to, you know, like the utilities or if you want to do load shed through a timer or, or, or something of that sort, then you would connect the red wire and that would power all three wires to the outdoor unit. Now we do send along the, uh, the electrical grease. Um, we want you to put that electrical grease in, on these wires when you put them together. Um, over time, these, if these dry out or they get corrosion or they, they get a loose connection, um, you know, you could lose data, you could lose uh, communication with the outdoor unit or the indoor unit. So anything outside, uh, make sure you use the, the, uh, the grease on there to, to um, keep that from happening. Now, if you don't use this demand response, this the, uh, the uh, wire here, just, just tape it off or, or um, put a wire nut on it or whatever. We don't, you know, just, just don't, don't use it. So. And again, it's on the same on the discharge for the uh, for the side discharge as well as the uh, um, regular upflow units. Now there is something that you probably need to be aware of here on the wires going to the outdoor unit. We've actually got a PTC resistor and a diode in there. It's a sacrificial resistor. So if you were to get a um, power surge or or something, what it does is it protects the outdoor unit from taking inrush current on the data wire and it sacrifices this diode or this PTC resistor. So if you ever run into a case where um, you're not communicating with the outdoor unit, it could be that this little diode is gone and, and it's, it's, inside the, the, uh, it's inside the unit so it's hard to see but if that's burned out or if that's been um, destroyed by high voltage or surge current, um, this thing will stop communicating. So don't miss this. Um, this has failed, and and you know you you try all kinds of things, and uh, the, the simplest thing to do is just take a continuity reading between data and the inside, see if it's failed or not. Uh, but be aware that that is in there. Okay. <clears throat> um, oh, not used on the side discharge. Okay, it's only on the upflow unit. So. Are on the 18 and 20 series units. Okay, um, we kind of covered the wiring, but if you're looking at the unit, the DRB, you know, and, and it doesn't matter what you have connected, if you've got a relay panel, if you've got a zone panel, indoor, outdoor unit, it, it, typical operating voltage on these should be about 12.4 to 12 point volts DC. So between D and B, which is uh, common, D and B would be common. You should see 12.8 volts DC, okay? Um, between R and B, of course, you're gonna see 24 volts, D, or AC, that's, that's communicating voltage. So when I put my meter on there and I, and I take a reading, I'm looking for 12.4, 12.8. Um, if I see 16 volts, that's an open circuit, okay? So that means that we're not communicating. We either have a broken wire, we have, we have something's wrong with the communication bus. 
So between data and common, if I see 16 volts, I know I have an open circuit. Um, in the same case, and I don't have a picture up here, if I were to see six volts or eight volts, that means I have a shorted circuit, okay? Um, the thing with DC voltage is we, when you have a short somewhere, it doesn't necessarily go to zero. Uh, it may just drop the voltage to six or eight volts. So if you have six or eight volts, the simplest thing to do is start con disconnecting components. As the voltage comes back, it'll tell you which component is the problem. So th these are typical voltages that you're looking for when you're working with the DC uh, communicating system. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can go to the thermostat and see what's online. So if you go into the 1050s, uh, into the summary tab table of communicating devices, it will list whatever's online. So if you have um, the outdoor unit and the TAM-8 area, and it won't list the thermostat because that's what we're, we're looking through. Um, but it'll tell you whether it's online or offline also. So that's another place to go uh, look for information if you're, if you're looking for information. Okay, on the, on the uh, 18 and 20 seer models, and here's that WV and U, your UVW that we, we were talking about. That's our inverter drive uh, nomenclature for the compressor. It's a three-phase compressor, but it is an inverter-driven piece of equipment. Um, on the 18 and 20 series, we actually have a shielded cable that goes from the drive to the compressor um, because we do get some frequency. Uh, we can get some radio frequency outputs on that, so uh, we needed to do that. On the 19 series, it's not there. Uh, we don't do that on that because it's a short couple. It's, the compressor is actually next to the drive, um, so we don't, didn't do that on the 19 series, only on the 18 and 20 series. Okay, CDA navigate, navigation, when you get into the controls, um, and again, I've got a video we're gonna go over at the end here that'll, that'll explain how that works, but uh, it'll give you the software builds, it'll give you the MOC, the motor software, uh, it'll give you the CD software build, this is all in the information that comes up on the control. Um, it'll give you the PM version, personality module version will come up on the control. And um, it says here, as of January 15th, we went to 2.0. Um, currently, we're at 3.1. We might even be at 3.3 at this point. I'd have to verify that. Um, but anytime they change something, they always uh, they change the 15th digit. So this digit, anytime there's an upgrade, they change these last two numbers here. Um, so you kind of know where you're at. Um, this would be, again, about 2015 model. Um, the current ones, I don't know if we're at a D or not. They'd have to look. So, um, setup and configuration. So, when you get into the menu and you look at the the um, uh, CDA and you want to get into the menu, here's our configuration menu. So, you uh, you hit the button to get to config menu. Once you get to configuration menu, you can um, scroll down through the different options and make some changes to the unit. Okay. There's some subtle things you can do, and uh, I'm gonna go through these one by one. Of course, number one, back up here. Number one is called external switch. So if you're gonna put this on a load shed, you know, what you do is you wire that, that red wire in, and then there's a set of contacts on the board for load shed. Um, you need to add a normally closed contact, and if that contact opens, it will throw the system in the load shed, okay? and you have to turn that on. It comes inactive, you turn it on to active. And then on the screen, when it goes into load shed, it will actually tell you that contact open, um, you're in load shed, and it'll display on the thermostat to let you know that, and also on the outdoor unit. And it says alert one external switch open. That doesn't really mean it's an alert. It's basically telling you that somebody's using load shed at that point, okay? Uh, minimum airflow. <clears throat> this one, um, we're gonna. I'm gonna talk a little bit about this because this one is is something you may or may not want to to deal with. Uh, but factory airflow is at 30 percent. So on a on an air conditioner, on a variable speed air conditioner, on the upflow, um, this the 18 and 20s here, 
the unit modulates down to 30, uh, 30%. On a heat pump, it actually modulates down to 25%. So what that means is from the factory, we can modulate down to as low as 30%. In some cases, that may, be, may not be enough airflow for us. So what we might have to do is go to 40% airflow or 50% airflow uh, to make the airflow uh, do what we need it to do. If you're on a non-zone system, air, that low of an airflow can be a problem. Now on the side discharge units, they're a little different. They come at 50%. So low fire on or low stage on a on a side discharge is 50%, whereas low stage on a 18 or 20 is 30%. Okay. Um, where that can cause you problems is in a case like this. If you have, I'm going to just just throw it out there. If you have an air conditioner. And, you know, each branch requires 200 CFM, so that tells me that I need 1,200 CFM for the system to operate properly, um, you know, do my transition and make sure that the airflow is good. So this 310 system is going to push 1,200 CFM. Everything is going to work good. Um, if it's a basement system like we're used to in this part of the country, um, we're going to have good airflow. The air conditioner is going to work fine. The heat pump is going to work fine, not a problem, okay? Where you run into problems is when we modulate down to 30%, um, now we've dropped our airflow to 60 CFM per outlet. Okay, so now instead of 1200 CFM, we're only pushing 360 CFM you know, through this ductwork, 188 CFM through here. 60 CFM on each one of these may not be enough for that register to work properly. So if you look, I'm gonna jump ahead. Um, if I'm used to moving 300 CFM, and say this is a 16 by six, I'm gonna push it 23 feet, okay? Now if I go down to that 160, I'm only gonna push that air about 14 to 16 feet, okay? So what that means is I'm gonna have stratified air, okay? So in a case like that, you may have to go to the outdoor unit and bring the airflow up on that just to make sure that we get enough air to, to, to dilute properly. Now, if the home has uh, destratification fans or ceiling fans, it's usually not a problem. It mixes the air very well. If it's a um, if it's a duct system that's down south where it's all in the attic, on the air conditioning, that low that low CFM is not a big deal because the cold air is going to drop out of the ceiling, and it's still going to cool the space very very well. Where you run into problems. In in our part of the world is when you you've got floor registers and you try to push that cold air up. Um, you get lazy air, you get lazy cold air that just lays on the floor. Um, in, in a case down south, they have a problem with the heating, okay? So in, in the in duct, in the attic duct system, they can't get the heat down to the floor because the air gets kind of lazy, it doesn't force it down. So again, remember that if you're using variable speed equipment, there are some airflow considerations you need to take into account. Now, if you put this on a zone system, that pretty much corrects it because you know, if only one zone is calling and you're modulating down on low speed, it's it, it's probably the best best uh, scenario you can think of. It's going to work probably pretty good. So on zoning, it, it's a good application. If you don't use it on zoning, um, just remember you do have to be aware of, of the airflow issues that can happen on a system like this. So, uh, and of course, make sure the return to supplies are in tech close together. So, you know, uh, make sure you've got the proper registers and... Uh, proper airflow. Now the other thing that happens is when you change that airflow from 30 to 50 percent it also changes the compressor speed. So if you change the airflow to 50 percent now the minimum um, modulation on the compressor becomes 50 percent also. <clears throat> um, we've got and then we've also got in here in there uh, we've got a, a comfort and um, efficiency mode, they come set for comfort. I wouldn't change that, okay? So that that comfort mode is, um, is kind of set up so that it's um, gonna give you warmer air. Basically what this is showing you is in comfort mode, here's my leaving air temperature. So in comfort mode, my air temperature actually on a heat pump will get up into this 104, 105 degree range. And um, it basically give you warmer air for not a whole lot extra um, uh, 
uh, power consumption to do that. So I would leave them in comfort mode if you're doing heat pumps. Uh, it's just going to give the customer better comfort for our part of the country. <clears throat> um, and then, of course, uh, we've got another one in there called PFC, <clears throat> which is our power uh, factor correction. You probably just want to leave that in auto unless you're using it on a, a generator. Okay, so um, if you it, it reduces the harmonic distortion for utilities and generators. If you turn it to if if you're gonna, it's recommended that you turn the PFC on for all generator application. It's got to do with counter EMF and back speed into the system. So um, if you're just using it on a, a, a conventional power source. Don't worry about it. If you're using it on a generator, uh, you probably want to turn that on. So, um, Heating max RPM. We've also got on the compressor, <clears throat> we've got a heating max RPM. We've got high, medium, and low. When you look at the operation of these units on cooling, we'll go to 3,600 RPM. That's our max RPM. But on our heating side, if you're using these as a heat pump, you can actually take them up as high as 4,800 to 5,200 RPM. Um, so on the heating side, these things do get a, quite a bit louder when they start ramping up to those higher speeds. Um, if that's objectionable to the owners, you can always turn it to low, which is gonna be 3,600 RPM. Uh, medium, which is gonna be somewhere in the middle, probably 4,200 RPM, something like that, or just leave it on high, okay? <clears throat> we also have something in the thermostat called quiet mode. And what you can do with quiet mode is you can enable it or disable it. And what that will do is between 10 p.m. and 6 p.m., it'll, it'll drop the compressor speed. Or you can even turn it off if you want to. So... Um, Quiet mode is, is in here. If you enable it, if you tell it enable, uh, you can select the compressor speed. You can, and I think this, I don't think you can select the time, but I believe it's between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. So you can turn it down to 50%. Uh, you can turn it off. Um, you can do whatever you want to do. Um, it's basically for, like it says here, it's for your local ordinance. Um, there are cities that don't allow um, compressors and heat pumps to run if they're noisy after 10 p.m. and that's kind of what this is for but uh, also if you have con customers that are not happy with the sound of the system um, you know if someone puts them next to a, a master bedroom you can hear them at night I, I, I guarantee them you will hear them so that's what this is put in there for so let's see if we got any questions here Oh, we're still good. So, all right. Um, we also have defrost termination. Uh, if you've got a situation where it's, it's not defrosting completely, the factory setting is at, uh, I think it brings it up, well, it's on the next page, but we can go to factory, medium, or high on defrost settings if we're not getting complete defrost. And that is, yeah, right here. So, Factory setting is about 47 degrees. Medium is about 53 degrees, and I believe high is 60 degrees. So what it does is it monitors the suction line temperature. Um, if you need more complete defrost, just take it to the medium or the high setting. Depends on what part of the country you're in. If there's a lot of humidity in the air, you're probably going to end up at high termination. Um, if you don't have a lot of humidity, you might end up down here. So it kind of all depends where you are in the country. Uh, but there are options for that uh, defrost termination. <clears throat> all right, so when you're, when you're charging these systems, the ideal way to do it is go to the thermostat, put it in charging mode cooling, and what it will do is when you, when you do that, it's going to give you up to 120 minutes of time and then it's going to say test in progress use subcooling when uh, when charging this system in, in service stacks um, when you're at the outdoor unit what you're actually going to see is you're going to see the unit stabilizing they don't want you to charge until it's stabilized until the pressures have stabilized 
So when it's okay to charge, it will actually tell you it's okay to charge. So I would give it, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Um, it says 20 minutes here, but you know, after 10 to 15 minutes, it's usually stabilized enough that you can could probably charge the system. Um, but if you're not sure, just wait for this to say okay to charge. Um, it'll be in system charging. It will display no demand because it's in a test mode. And it's going to display the compressor speed, which is about 3,600 RPM. <clears throat> um, and again, compressor speed and RPM, it all depends on load uh, from the thermostat. But here's your suction pressure, your discharge temperature, um, and your subcooling. So if the compressor is operating at 1,500 RPM, um, you're going to get, um, you're not going to get a proper charge. You get above four degrees. You got to get up to the 3,600 RPM for it to charge properly. So that's pretty much what this says. All right. Um, why don't we take about a five minute break, get a cup of coffee, <clears throat> and I'll come back at eight o'clock and we'll finish up here. <laughs> Some people never learn, right?
All right, guys. I, by my time, it's eight o'clock, so we'll, we'll get we'll back on this here. Um, didn't see any chat questions, so we'll just keep going. Uh, check charge mode heating. Um, again, the one note on here says that when we're charging, it's going to open all the dampers if this is on a zone system. Uh, check charge mode heating is, it gives you an idea if your charge is okay, but it's not really the way we want to charge it. Um, it's, it's, it's more or less to say, okay, yeah, it's, it's cold outside. The thing's working somewhere where it should be within the, the, uh, the values of the service facts. Um, and again, it allows you to, to uh, enter, and you can do a defrost. Uh, you can check defrost. You can uh, uh, put s system in test. It'll run up to two hours again also in that um, for check charge heating. Um, checkout mode cooling. This is kind of a, a feature we put in there for, um, as for a matter of fact, for cooling or heating. Um, if you get compressor noise or you get a, a strange noise that, that you can't isolate, you can actually run the system in 5% increments and um, run it all the way up or all the way down. And if, if a consumer hears a noise at a certain value, you can leave it sit there and investigate if there's any noise, if there's refrigeration noise, uh, line noise, that kind of thing. So it allows you to do that, um, heating or cooling. And then we also have a pump down mode cooling. On this unit, you can actually close the valve to the unit, the discharge valve, uh, hit pump, on mode cooling and pump all the refrigerant back into the outdoor unit. And when it's in back in the outdoor unit, it, it will say, okay, to close valve, you close the suction line valve and then do your repairs and uh, evacuate the, the, uh, the refrigerant side or the, the evaporator side. And when you're done, open the valve and you're good to go. So it has that option to pump down cooling or pump down heating. So in the heating mode, you can pump it back in the coil in the cooling mode, you pump, pump it back in the condenser. Uh, just allows you to do that without having to recharge or, or uh, reclaim the system. <clears throat> um, if you want it, if you want more time, you can add more time. Um, the, D, uh, the CDA will, uh, you know, display the suction pressure. Um, it bypasses the, the valve when we're in a pumped on mode. So um, uh, CDA gives you just a ton of information. Okay. Now on the unit, we have oil return algorithms. We've got some startup algorithms. We want to make sure we have proper um, oil in the system. So the way the system works, and we've got cold air draft protect, prevention. Um, at startup, you know, it, the, the uh, IVSC, the inverter drive, looks at compressor speed, outdoor fan speed, indoor blower speed, EEV position. And it runs the unit at 2,400 RPM for the first minute of operation. So what it's going to do, it's going to ramp to 2,400 RPM, run there for a minute, uh, and that's to get oil return through the system. After a minute, the compressor will ramp up or ramp down, depends on demand. So, um, But that first minute, you are going to go to 2,400 RPM. Um, and again, this can all be affected by outdoor temperature, humidity, uh, coil temperature, efficiency settings, protection flags, D-rates, um, and we're going to go through some of those and explain how they, um, how they work. Okay, so two events can initiate a shutdown. Emergency shutdown, high pressure switch is going to shut you down immediately. And a normal shutdown, which uh, means the comfort control is satisfied. Uh, we've got oil management algorithms built in. When you look at these units, you're going to see there's a compressor lube, which means that the compressor is lubricating, or you're going to see a system oil return. Um, and that, those are normal. You, you're going to see those on the system. It just depends on what's going on and, and how the system is operating. Okay. So again, oil management, we've got a high capacity pump in here. We run the compressor at 2,400 RPM for 60 seconds. Um, to try to keep the system lubricated. So as the system's running, and, and we have short cycles of less than 10 minutes, it may um, implement or it may start some oil return or some compressor lube operation that will show up on the display. If the dome temperature is below the ambient during system startup or after a power cycle, the system will enter oil return mode, okay? So it's trying to make sure we've got oil to the system. 
We've got a preheat algorithm. Um, we've got, uh, we don't have a crankcase heater on these. What we do is we use one of the windings and it draws about 40 watts. So on these units, you're gonna do, when you do an amp reading, you might see seven, seven and 14. That means that one winding is actually being used as a crankcase heater. So um, it's in there as a preheat. And there's certain um, things that need to be met for that, um, for that uh, crankcase heater to work or that some people um, add power up and if the outdoor temperature is below 85. And you know, I, in, in the instructions, it tells you don't run the system uh, for three hours and to let the crankcase heater warm up. Um, if it's in the summertime and it's 90 degrees outside, I don't think that's gonna be a big issue, okay? Um, in the wintertime, if it's 20 degrees outside, yeah, you probably want to let that crankcase heater warm up, get the oil warm before we run the system. So, uh, again, if it's below 85, that's it's uh, it's going to come on. Uh, if the if the temperature is below 80 and the compressor dome temperature is less than the outdoor ambient, it'll be on. Um, when the outdoor temperature goes above 85, it turns off. And anytime the compressor is running, it turns off. Uh, and for 50 minutes after each compressor cycle. Um, preheat algorithm, again, um, if you want to take a look at it, you go into the monitor menu, uh, system, then to the drive, then go to compressor power, and down to drive amps. And drive amps are going to be um, 14, you know, there it is, U, V, and W. Uh, 14, 7, and 7, that means that the compressor crankcase heater is on. Um, you're also going to see a, a spike in the DC volts. Um, it, it's going to read these peaks when the compressor, uh, when the crankcase heater is on for preheat. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time on dehumidification. It's, it's in the system. Um, if you turn it on on the thermostat, on the 1050 or the 850, um, it will go to a dehumidification mode, which means that it drops the airflow by 30%. Um, it may drop the airflow by 30%, but the compressor is still going to run at its, its rated speed, and it's going to try to maintain about um, 30 degrees of superheat um, based on the, uh, on the outdoor unit. Uh, protections on the system. Uh, we have protections for uh, compressor not allowed to increase speed regardless of thermostat demand. That's a hold. Um, the compressor will adjust speed to recover from a protection. Um, the compressor will reduce speed in response to extreme refrigerant pressures. That's going to change the speed. Uh, we go into a shutdown due to extreme condition. Um, and we also have something called a release. This is what allows the compressor to return to normal operation. So, uh, transducer protections, uh, low suction pressure protection algorithm controls the, the compressor speed or shutdown. Um, and this slide actually does a better job of explaining it. Okay, so if you're, if you're working on a system, we've got freeze protection. So if the pressure drops below 28 degrees saturated or 93 pounds for 20 minutes, the compressor will start to reduce speed. Um, the indoor fan and outdoor fan motors will track with the compressor. So in other words, it will all work together at that point to try to keep it from, from freezing. The compressor will shut down if the saturated condition reaches 20 degrees saturated, 78 PSI, and the protection is released when the saturated condition reaches 35 degrees again. So that, that's basically your freeze protection. And it's based on um, runtime and pressures. Low suction pressure, <clears throat> excuse me, protections. Low, pre low suction pressure protections will generate a hold condition when the suction pressure reaches 75 pounds cooling or 20 pounds in heating. If the suction pressure continues to drop, the drive will start to decrease the compressor speed in an attempt to increase suction pressure. If the suction reaches 50 pounds in cooling or 13 pounds in the heating mode, 
the drive will shut down the outdoor unit for a five minute soft lockout. So the, the compressor will try to, the, the drive will actually try to overcome the situation, um, but if it can't, you will go into a shutdown at that point. The suction pressure must reach 80 pounds in the cooling mode or 25 in the uh, heating mode to release the protection. So if we're in a low pressure or if we have a, a leak in the system, it, it's not gonna restart the compressor. We have to get back to that 80 pounds. Five low pressure suction lock, uh, soft lock trips will generate a hard lock. And at that point, you're gonna have to recycle the outdoor power. It's gonna throw a coat on the thermostat. Um, that's not something the consumer can reset. That we, that's not something we want them to reset. So the, the point of all this is there's a lot of things the compressor will try to do to overcome a situation. And if we get to the point where it's five um, of these trips, it's gonna lock it out, throw, throw a code. If you're on Nexia Diagnostics, it'll send a code to you guys in the office, um, but it's definitely gonna shut down the unit. If it shuts down the unit, locks it out, it'll throw the unit into emergency heat if it's a heat pump. And if it's an air conditioner, it's just plain gonna lock out and we're not gonna have air conditioning at that point. So what you'll see is uh, the, it'll lock out on the unit, hard lockout. Um, at the control, it's going to give you an error code, give you a hard lockout, max norm low. Um, and I don't remember what that stands for, but if you see that, you know you're in a hard lockout at that point. High pressure protections. Uh, we have a high pressure switch on the system. If that trips uh, six times, it will go into a hard lockout and the system will. Um, throw a code on the thermostat. Um, it'll give you uh, six trips and then a five minute soft lock and after the sixth one it's going to go into a hard lockout and the system's going to lock out at that point. Again, we don't want the consumer resetting this and just moving on. We want someone to come out and take a look at it. If this goes into a hard lockout, they'll get a, an alert. If you're on Nexia Diagnostics, you'll also get an alert. Um, dome temperature sensor, if it reaches 240 degrees, it's going to put it in a hold condition. Um, it's going to adjust the compressor speed if, the continue, if it continues to increase, will shut down at 270 degrees. So in other words, once it hits too far, 240, it's going to put you in a hold and it will try to adjust that to keep the, the unit running cooler. Um, the drive will release the alert once the temperature drops back below 230 degrees. Okay. Um, there's other sensors embedded into the drive monitor. Um, again, it's going to show you the cutout conditions and it's going to enforce a 15 minute minimum compressor off cycle for high temperature protections. Um, we've got limp along mode. This is what's going to happen if you get into some of these situations where um, if you have multiple sensors that are giving you issues, um, if it's running at a, at a higher temperature, it'll, it'll run to safe mode. So in other words, it's going to lock the system in at 2400 RPM. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to not allow it to ramp up or ramp down. It's going to throw code. So in limp along mode, it's going to um, put you in 2400 RPM safe speed that allows for oil return. And it's going to give you operation of the system. Um, ambient temperature sensor, uh, if that fails in the heating mode, the system will reference the outdoor coil sensor. Um, a failed ambient sensor will also generate a yellow triangle to let you know there's a problem with the system. Um, doesn't affect the cooling all that much. Um, it just goes to back to normal operation. Uh, limp along mode with low superheat. Um, it could be an EEV composite body, or the body could, you know, it's sensitive to heat. If the body exceeds 240 degrees, if, if you put these in, I guess this is pretty much what this is saying is if you put an EEV in and you melted the label on the valve, you've overheated it, the valve is not going to work properly. Um, if you've not seen what an EEV valve does, it's actually a spiral. It spins open and closed on a needle valve. And, um, 
when they're uh, when they get overheated or they get uh, stuff in the system they do wear they do um, they do not work properly um, there's a clean valve there's a contaminated valve so what they do is they spin open they spin closed uh, there's a 12 second drive time on these so what happens is the magnetic field actually uh, makes the valve spin open or spin closed on these threads right here so you what you will hear is a click 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 for 12 seconds that's the valve opening or closing um, if you don't hear that click, 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 then the valve could be, uh, could be, have been overheated or bad or, or it's got a problem with it. So um, you should hear that valve. We've got a, a video that explains how that sounds if you haven't heard one coming up. So um, defrost termination uh, depends on where you're at. Anything below 47 degrees, uh, it's not going to terminate, it's not going to go into a defrost. Um, 47 to 22, it could go into defrost up to 15 minutes. And then again, when you get into the colder temperatures, it could be as little as 12 minutes every three hours. Uh, but it all depends on the outdoor temperature. So defrost, again, uh, if it's not fully defrosting, you may have to go to a warmer defrost termination. Um, fault codes and diagnostics. There's a lot of things in the system um, that can go wrong if you and, and if you know where to look for them, uh, you know you you can make you uh, save you an awful lot of time. So normal uh, alert just tells you that there's something going on with a white triangle. Um, it's it's an alert history screen. It's normal alerts, uh, just transient conditions or something going on with the system frost protection. Uh, major, which is a yellow alert, um, it'll clear itself and continue running, but when you hit a critical alert, which is a red triangle, typically it's gonna lock up the system and throw a code at the thermostat for the consumer. Um, again, system can go into a soft lockout or a hard lockout, depending on what's going on. We talked about those with the high pressure, low pressure, high temperature. Um, and again, alerts, this is a review of what we talked about. The high pressure can lock you out, the low pressure, um, technician who enters drive diagnostic and, or evacuation node will force the outdoor unit into a hard lockout condition. Drive diagnostic will recover after two hour period. The other thing is when you put these in test mode, it clears the faults on the system. Um, it's kind of a nice byproduct. If you want to clear the faults, just put it in a test mode. Um, Again, more faults that'll show up on the screen, indoor coil frost. Um, you know, go to the system, look at the system, see what's going on. It'll give you the superheat. Um, it'll give you diagnostics. Uh, I think we're at the point where I've got some videos coming up here. Um, the, the, chat, the, the charts are very self-explanatory. If you get into the flow charts, it'll run you through the drive test. Um, you can test the compressor, you can test the EEV, you can test the fan motor. Um, you can test all this stuff by running these drive diagnostics and, and uh, system tests. Uh, again, all built into the CDA. So if, if you want to get into diagnostics, what you do is you start at the monitor menu, you go to the configure menu, control, run drive test, and it'll say testing. And it's either gonna say uh, test result, drive passed or drive failed. If it failed, do it again. Uh, if you get two fails in a row, call me or, or at that point we look at uh, replacing the, the drive. Um, we can run um, compressor test and it will look at the windings. It'll look for shorted windings, open windings, uh, locked rotor, uh, failed drive hardware or it'll look at pass. So it, it can give you a lot of information just from running these tests. <clears throat> okay, a um, couple things before I get to the videos, there's some videos that are gonna be pretty self-explanatory. Um, integrated variable speed control is on mandatory return. So if you do have one of these fail, um, give us a call. Um, if you have most damage, also give me a call. Um, we're interested in that. Uh, get pre-authorization from one of the service guys in the field. And um, fill out the warranty form, the Gustav Larson warranty form online. 
hang on to the drive until somebody you know gives you information whether you should scrap it or send it back. Um, currently, they've been asking for all of them back. So if you fill out the Gusto Larson warranty form, you should have everything you need. Just make sure you include, include the serial number from the drive. There's also a serial number on here that needs to be on that form. So, okay. Um, I'm going to go to some videos here and um, show you what's on fieldtechhelp.com. Let's see here. New share. Okay. So this is fieldtechhelp.com. I went into the variable speed videos. Um, this is a variable speed outdoor product startup and operation. This is what a typical system should sound like um, when you operate it. So I'm gonna play this video. And here. Shoot. That's, that's showing up guys or no? Hang on. Screen share. There we go. Variable speed. No, I'm just going to Mac. Oh, okay. Okay. Speed outdoor unit startup and operations. The purpose of this video is to demonstrate the wide variety of operational characteristics of a variable speed outdoor unit. As with any new technology, it is critical to understand the sequence of operations. This video will document a series of system behaviors and sounds of a properly operating variable speed system. Initial power up, start up, normal operations, system shutdown, compressor lube, oil return, system pump down. Where'd it go? Come on. Defrost, run outdoor fan test, and light load low pressure ratio. Initial power up. When power is applied to the system, the communications display assembly, or CDA, will display the version and build number of the unit. The CDA will then indicate that the system is in standby mode. While the control is booting up, the LED lights will provide additional visual feedback. Initially, the green status LED will display a fast flash indicating the power up delay, followed by a steady flash of once per second when in standby and twice per second when a call for capacity is present. The amber COM LED will begin flashing once per communicating device found on the system. Now note that it may take a minute or so for all devices to be discovered. During the power-up procedures, the system will self-check the drive's relays and sensors. This is followed by a rapid tapping sound from the electronic expansion valve as it is overclosed to ensure that it is in the fully closed position. This is used to calibrate the EEV. The system will now enter standby mode. Here is the complete power-up sequence in real time. startup. When a call for capacity is received from the comfort control or when certain test modes are entered, the variable speed outdoor unit initiates its startup algorithm. This ensures adequate lubrication of the compressor at the startup of each cycle.
During startup, the compressor will ramp to 2400 RPM and run for one minute. The outdoor fan and indoor blower will operate at minimum speeds during this one minute period. After the one minute lubrication period, the compressor, outdoor fan, and indoor blower will ramp up or down to deliver the demand requested from the comfort control. When the system load is small, the outdoor unit will run at minimum speed and cycle on and off to match the demand from the thermostat. When the load is high, the outdoor unit will modulate its capacity to meet the demand from the thermostat. System shutdown. On system shutdown, the compressor speed is gradually ramped down to 900 RPM, at which time it will coast to a complete stop. The outdoor fan will match the ramping of the compressor, and the indoor blower will cycle off according to the blower off delay configured in the CDA. Compressor lube. After running for 20 consecutive minutes at a speed of less than 2400 RPM, compressor lube mode will initiate. During compressor lube mode, the compressor will ramp up to 2400 RPM for one minute, then return to the calculated speed from the comfort control. The outdoor fan and indoor blower will not ramp up during this process, but will continue to run at the calculated load speeds. The compressor lube mode should not be noticed by the occupant from inside the house. However, this one minute speed increase may be noticed at the outdoor unit, and it is normal operational behavior designed for compressor reliability. Oil return. Oil return mode is initiated on power-up when the compressor dome temperature is below 80 degrees Fahrenheit or when the system has logged five duty cycles of 10 minutes or less. The purpose of the oil return mode is to provide increased velocity and pressure in the refrigeration system to return oil to the compressor. Oil return mode runs the compressor at 2400 RPM for a total of 15 minutes accumulated run time. Oil return mode may be noticed by the occupant since the indoor blower will increase to match compressor speed during the 15 minute accumulated runtime. This is normal operation behavior and again it is designed for compressor reliability. System pump down. When pump down mode is initiated from the comfort control, the technician can isolate the refrigerant charge to the outdoor unit or to the indoor unit. The outdoor unit's CDA will display pump down on line one and the suction pressure and the low pressure trip point on line two. In this scenario, the trip point is zero PSIG. 
the CDA will update every four seconds, and when the suction pressure reaches the trip point, the unit will stop running, and the CDA will display pump down complete, close service valve. As the system pumps down, a high pressure ratio condition will cause the scroll plates to begin to separate and the sound of mechanical contact will be noticeable. This is normal and expected. Defrost. Defrost occurs naturally when frost accumulation is detected on the outdoor coil. A forced defrost option is available to test this functionality. Forced defrost is initiated from the CDA control menu and the system must be running in heating mode. Pressing enter from this screen will force the LSOV to cooling mode and turn off the outdoor fan. The coil temperature sensor or CTS is monitored and the test will terminate when the coil temperature warms to 47 degrees Fahrenheit or the maximum time override of 15 minutes expires. When the test is complete, the LSOV will switch back to heating mode and the outdoor fan will turn on. Outdoor Fan Test The outdoor fan test is initiated from the CDA control menu. This function runs the outdoor fan at 100% CFM. To terminate the fan test, navigate the CDA button to the right and press enter, or the test will automatically terminate after one hour. Light load low pressure ratio. Under light load conditions, when the outdoor temperature is moderate to cool, the variable speed compressor may produce a discharge pulsation while running at low RPM. This is normal and expected. This concludes this video on variable speed startup and operations. For additional information, please refer to system documentation, the variable speed technical service guide, and additional videos available at www.fieldtechhelp.com. Okay, um, we got a, I got a, another video here I want to show. Um, again, these are all um, these are all on fieldtechhelp.com. All these videos are available to you. Um, and bear with me a second here. I gotta get over to the screen here. Let me get this up here. Okay, so one of the questions that I, I get the most uh, questions on is run drive test, um, which we're going to play here. And This one, share. There we go. Yeah, run drive test is, is probably the one when I, we go through when we suspect the drive in the field. So I'm going to play this one and I'm going to open it up for questions. And uh,
running the drive diagnostic test. The goal of this video is to demonstrate the steps involved in performing the drive diagnostics test on variable speed outdoor units. This process is described in the CDA technician's control menu section which is located in the unit's service facts and the variable speed outdoor system technical service manual. When to run the drive test. The drive diagnostic test should be performed when alert codes indicate a problem with the drive. Directions are found in the possible calls column of the alert code description table, and this table is also found in the outdoor unit's service facts and the variable speed technical service manual. The drive test is initiated from the communicating display assembly, or CDA, which is located behind the outdoor unit's service panel. By loosening the nylon screws that secure the CDA, it can be easily removed and handheld for convenient operation. Caution should be exercised when working in this area of the unit as high voltage is present just to the left on the board. To access the drive test, enter the technician control menus by pressing and holding the top and bottom buttons on the CDA for five seconds until the monitor menu appears. Then scroll over to the control menu using the right or left buttons. From here, scroll down to the run drive test screen. Note that the system must be clear of all active alerts and cannot be in lockout. This test will not run if either of these conditions exists. From the run drive test screen, press enter to begin the test. The CDA will show that testing is in progress and the system will shut down. After the compressor stops, the actual testing will begin and should complete in approximately 30 seconds. When the test is complete, the compressor will run for one minute. Past no fault. If the drive completed the test with no faults, the CDA will display past no fault. The drive passed the diagnostic procedure and is not defective. Failed drive hardware. If the CDA displays failed drive HW, the drive hardware may be defective. Repeat the test, and if the CDA displays failed drive HW a second time, the drive hardware is defective and should be replaced. Refer to the warranty claim process found in the service facts or technical service manual, and be sure to call your local FSR for a warranty claim preauthorization number. All drives are on mandatory return. A replacement procedure video can be viewed at www.fieldtechhelp.com. Shorted wire winding. If the CDA displays shorted wire winding, a short was detected in the compressor cable or winding. Using a volt ohm meter, identify the shorted cable or winding and repair as necessary. Refer to the compressor winding shorted video at www.fieldtechhelp.com and to system documentation for complete details. Open wire winding. Open wire winding on the CDA indicates that an open circuit was detected in the compressor cable or winding. Again, using a volt ohm meter, identify the open cable or winding and repair as necessary. Refer to the compressor windings open video at www.fieldtechhelp.com and to system documentation for complete details. Failed locked rotor. If the CDA displays failed locked rotor, allow compressor preheat to operate for at least 12 hours or remove charge. Then rerun the drive diagnostics. If the CDA displays failed locked rotor again, replace the compressor. All compressors are on mandatory return. This concludes this video on running the drive diagnostic test on variable speed outdoor units. For additional information, please refer to system documentation, the technical guide, and additional videos available at www.fieldtechhelp.com. All right, guys, there's, there's a ton more videos in there. And, and um, like I said, we, we pushed a lot of information out this morning. So um, I'm, I'm going to call it uh, call it a morning here unless anybody has questions but I would recommend that if you don't have the service book reach out to me um, send me an email and I'll send you a PDF copy of the service book for the variable speed equipment um, and if you have anything else at all give me a call let me uh, take a quick look at chat here 
and see if there's anything in there. Um, and no, I don't see anything. So uh, we're going to wrap up a little bit early this morning, guys. And uh, thank you for your time and have a good day.